Amen. Say good evening to everyone. It is a blessing to be gathered on another Wednesday night. Thank the Lord for gracing us with another day and a, another blessed occasion where we can come and study his word. We've been in our Jesus You May Not Know series, and we're going to continue that tonight. Um, but we're blessed um, that we have the observance of our church anniversary on the horizon on the 15th. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the church a little bit, uh, probably before that time um, as well. Be mindful this Sunday at 3 p.m. We'll be journeying to Colleen to greater peace for Pastor Moland's anniversary. Remember on the 14th, Brother Price and Divine Messengers will be celebrating their 21st anniversary. I believe it's the last week you can see him for tickets. So a few things going on the calendar, and of course we want to continue to pray for our sick members and those recovering from surgery as well as the bereaved families. But in this Jesus You May Not Know series, we've been kind of trying to introduce Jesus from a lot of different angles. So if somebody should happen to ask you about your faith, you'll be able to share with them uh, about Jesus, not about religion, um, not about theology per se, but actually Jesus and the relationship that you can have with him. Um, much as God's perfect will is that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance, it should be that for as many as we can share, we recognize that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And what people need in these day and this day and age, I believe more than anything else is hope. And I believe that hope is best expressed um, when you, you offer to somebody personally, not an empty promise of like a political uh, congressman or a political pundit or somebody running for office or somebody running for acclamation and attribution, but legitimate hope. And that's really only found in Jesus Christ. And the more that you know about him, not from a historical standpoint, not from somebody else's opinion, but you know yourself, then uh, my belief is better you can share him with somebody else. And then the better that you know him, better we can grow in our relationship with him. But this last one that we deal with here in this Bible study um, really speaks to who Jesus is, but different than some other occasions where we've dealt with this, uh, speaks to who he's not. And I think uh, the understanding of Jesus and his person, his personality, and, and, and what he tried to bring across through his life and his lifetime sometimes is missed because People will say, well, that's who Jesus is, but you also need to say who he's, who he's not. I can remember I, I was, um, and just this is the way my checking account is set up, so don't judge, but I was making some Kool-Aid at the, at the house, and, and I was going to make it the strawberry lemonade Kool-Aid. So I had strawberries. I had the mix packs of the, the red and the almost red Kool-Aid, and I'm mixing it in there, and it looked that kind of pinkish yellow cover color, and I had the lemons, and I had the lemons in there, and it's good, and then I, I chilled it, and I said, man, whenever this is ready, man, this is going to be good, and I went to taste it, and the sourest thing I ever tasted. I didn't put any sugar in there. So for what I intended for it to be, it wasn't because it lacked, it didn't have, it didn't have sugar. And so for as, as much as my design and desire for the end product was to be something, it wasn't because it lacked something that would make it what it was. Well, think about that a little bit as we're going through this study tonight. The Jesus you may not know. Offering forgiveness from the cross. And we reference this in Luke, the 23rd chapter, 34th verse. We're going to concentrate really on just one verse. If you read uh, throughout that entire chapter, you'll get the whole picture. But in the King James Version, it said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. NIV says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Now see this from the Amplified Version. In verses 34 and 35. And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his clothes amongst themselves. Notice they dividing the clothes. That was prophesied that would happen. Now the people stood by watching, but even the rulers ridiculed and sneered at him, saying, he saved others from death. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God, his chosen one. Very distinctly in verse 34, we find out Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Here's the juxtaposition of everything. They knew exactly what they thought they were doing. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're, they're doing. This, this, this crucifixion of Christ would stain Romans. It would stain Jews. It would stain Christians. Everything that happened, it stains Christians because they're saying if they were there, they should, even they were there first called Christians at Antioch, it said that they should have done something because this was wrong. The Jews were wrong because they asked the Romans to carry it out. The Romans were wrong because they carried it out. A lot of wrong there, but Jesus is saying, forgive, forgive them. Now, mind you, he's there. He'd been betrayed by one of his disciples before then. He had been scourged. He had been beaten. He had been spat upon. He had been mocked. All of those things happened. Now he's on the, on the cross getting ready to say, it is, this is right before, it is finished. And he's having a conversation with his father who's not going to be able to look on the sin that's imputed, placed on his son, saying, forgive them because they, they know not what they're doing. And again, I've said this before, and again, be, being very honest, plain speaking, uh, that's a lot of forgiveness. You know, that, that's, that's a little bit more than, you know, hey, I... I burnt the toast, or hey, I burnt the barbecue. That's a little bit more, will you forgive me? That's a little bit more. I'm sorry, I raised, raised my voice, and I yelled, and I hollered, and I, 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 that's a lot more than, I'm not saying measure forgiveness, because we've been, been called to forgive and to ask for forgiveness, but in the midst of what's going on with people intentionally trying to hurt and kill you, because you are the Christ, and again, think about this. The reason why we, we had 35 come from the Amplified Version, because when you go deeper into the language, they were mocking him for who he was. When he's placed on the cross, they place an inscription above his head saying that he was king of, he was king of the Jews. So somewhere somebody believed that he thought that's who he was. So they mocked him, right? Hmm, very interesting. Now we get here, and they're saying, well, save yourself. If you be the Christ, if you be the Messiah, if you be the anointed one, save yourself. He already had asked for forgiveness. Now, again, we get into the Jesus you may not know. He's, he's, he's stretched wide, hands, uh, nails in his hand, nails in his feet, crown of thorns on his, on his head. He's being asphyxiated from the inside out through the process of, of, of crucifixion, and he's asking for forgiveness for people who don't want to be forgiven. So what they knew, not what they were doing, they understood the process of crucifixion. They understood the process of male factors. Jesus was betrayed in between two of those, two thieves on the cross. They understood everything that it took to get to this point, but they didn't understand forgiveness. Because who does it say parted his clothes? It said it was some soldiers, right? One of the most poignant scriptures, and we won't get into this tonight, so we won't be here all night. Is the centurion looked and said, surely this must have been 
Well, I'm, uh, uh, hold on now. Verse 35, now the people stood by watching, but even the rulers ridiculed and sneered at him, saying, he saved others from death. I'm talking about Lazarus. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, of God, his chosen one. Now, I, I, Jesus encompasses a lot when you say just that name, but uh, Christ, Messiah, anointed, son of God, chosen one, that gets, that gets, that gets Jesus kind of encapsulated. That were their words that they spoke about them. And so when Jesus is asking for forgiveness, the, the cross was necessary for our salvation, but them playing a hand in it wasn't necessary for them. Let's go a little bit deeper on that thought. Jesus came from heaven. He was so named because he would save his people from their sins. Everything that he did to announce that he was the Christ, that announced that the promise would be fulfilled, the lame walking, the blind receiving their sight, the deaf hearing, uh, the, the gospel being preached to the poor, all of those, the dumb talking, all those things that would announce him prophetically as the answer to the promise, he was. But for him to be Jesus, he had to die on the cross. So when the Lord's intention in the midst of the triune and triune, triunity of, of the Godhead had Jesus to come as the incarnation, God becoming fleshed amongst men to die as God, fully man, fully holy. And he was the only one that could die because save best another man could do would be to die for himself. But he's dying for all of humanity. So for him to come, the necessity was for him to be on that cross. That's why he came. And he needed to die on that cross. But the blessing is he got up. So he had power over this, over, over life and death. Oh, grave, where's I victory? Oh, death, where's that sting? That's where we go there, right? But now understand this. When he's asking his father to forgive them, the Godhead is speaking in forgiveness. This isn't an absolute to send all of them who killed Jesus to hell with the absence of forgiveness. You're probably saying somebody killed the Lord, you know, hell would be a nice abode for them. Well, let's talk about that. Sometimes we place, there's only one sin for which there's not forgiveness, and that's blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. So you can be forgiven for crucifying Jesus. And how do we know this? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. A lot of sins that need to be forgiven really are in the, in the ignorance realm. When I didn't know Jesus, there's some stuff that I, I did. I didn't understand. I didn't know to do better. But then so I don't get so high and mighty on the other side of salvation, I got to understand there's some things I've done since I've been saved that disappoint and prick the very heart of the Lord. And because he stays there weighing in forgiveness... then I don't get what I deserve. So he came so that hell wouldn't be my home, but he also came that sometimes grace and mercy may buffet what I deserve in the midst of me not living up to my spirituality and my discipleship. So sometimes people don't know Jesus like that. They don't know that he stands there and his desire is to extend forgiveness. Again, 1 John 1 and 9. That knowing that he is faithful and just to forgive, that's who he is. For as much as God is love, the blessing is God is forgiveness. Because also, remember, this, you know, some people's favorite verse in the Bible, vengeance is mine, say it the Lord. So people love the Lord to act in, in vengeance, but understand this, sin is enmity against God. Sin causes the relationship between God, of which Jesus is a part of the Godhead, to be strained. Much as our relationship with me would be affected if every time that I saw you, I came up and hit you in the middle of your forehead. We're not going to have as great a relationship if I do that every time that I see you. So for as much as when we sin and we, and we come short and we transgress the way and will of God, the, the blessing is he stands there saying, Father, forgive them. Now again, old preacher said, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. 
But I'm thankful Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they, they don't know what they're. They didn't, have any, they didn't have any idea the ramifications for what they did. They ushered in salvation for, for everyone who would call on that name. They didn't know they were doing that. They thought they were killing somebody who was either going to overthrow the government or that, that was an enemy of the Sanhedrin. That's who they thought they were killing. And then to cloak it, they say, well, you know, he's a, he's a blasphemer against the, the government. He says he's God. Yeah, pretty much. He didn't lie because he couldn't. The thing about God is he can't lie. And then they didn't either because they said exactly who he was. If you are that, if you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, if you're the anointed of God, his chosen one, if you're, the, if you're him, save yourself. He didn't need saving. We did. That's why he was on the cross. That's why he was there at that place. Let's move on. Got this from Daily Bible Devotional. In Luke 23, 34, we encounter Jesus on the cross offering forgiveness to those who were crucifying him. Despite the pain and suffering he was enduring, Jesus chose to extend grace and mercy to those who were responsible for his crucifixion. This powerful act of forgiveness demonstrates the depth of Jesus' love for humanity and serves as a model for us to follow in our own lives. Forgiveness. If we understand forgiveness from from the aspect of Jesus forgiving from the cross and understand that that this piddly stuff we have to forgive people for, we'll we'll forgive more. Let's just take it deeper. We stand in the need of something to be forgiven for. Consistently, we're not perfect. We're going to have to come to somebody and say, you know, and I need you to forgive me. And Jesus weighs there with them, you would say, that shouldn't be forgiven. He asked for forgiveness. And and we in need of forgiveness, he is forgiveness. So maybe we should take his example and be be like him. Well, here's where the rubber meets the road. A lot of people don't associate with the church as they should because many times the church says that they don't forgive. Well, if Jesus is forgiving people, killing them, then how am I removed from my responsibility to have my arms open in forgiveness? Now, again, I'm not in indulgence. I'm not saying, well, yeah, if you sin and it's contrary to the will and way of God, do that and it's okay. That's different. That's something else. But I know you can be forgiven. And so if you can be forgiven, here's the challenge. Here's the people that, here's the Jesus that, that people don't know. If you can be forgiven, you can live forgiven. It's it's a different thing to live forgiven. You know somebody, you've wronged somebody, and you've really truly been forgiven. That's a different relationship. I'm not talking about words. I'm not talking about pacification, but I'm talking about you've wronged somebody, they've forgiven you, and your relationship has been restored. And now you can live, you can live forgiven. Let's move on. Even in the midst of his own agony, Jesus was able to see the ignorance and spiritual blindness of his tormentors. He understood that they were acting without fully comprehending the consequences of their actions, and he chose to forgive them. This verse challenges us to consider how we respond to those who have hurt or wronged us. Are we willing to extend forgiveness even when it is difficult or painful? The cross and crucifixion, it doesn't get any more painful. And Jesus is asking for forgiveness, but they don't know what they, they're ignorant. They're blind. Why are they ignorant and blind? Their rage against who he said he is blinds them. They're ignorant to who he really is, even though they say who he must be if he can save him himself. And they're there because now they're, at, they're in duty. It's their obligation. It's their duty to carry out this crucifixion. Their duty and their obligation to kill the Lord. It's a dangerous thing. Religion many times, and even poor theology, operates out of duty. 
We, you got to. No, you don't. You got to do anything except, except, except Jesus as your personal Savior. Now, you may not get to any discipleship, but you can get to salvation. So it doesn't say like the world religions, you need to pray at these intervals across the day. It doesn't say you need to do these particular things, and, and, and it doesn't say you have to do all of that. It doesn't say you have to burn this and do this sacrament. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It, it, it doesn't say you have to. That's duty and obligation in its, in its form. And what happens, the reason why the church many times is more offensive than it is attractive is because we say you got to do all these things, and people come in asking, where is that? I, I'm reading my Bible and studying. Where is that written? Well, you, well, we've always done it this way. Well, we've always done it this way wrong. And then some things within, I see Red Mills happen, some things within what we do, somebody thought it was a good idea and nobody ever said it was a bad idea and now it's tradition and formality. Needed something, and all the way to the end, I don't think that we ever understood that we, mankind, didn't understand love. And I think that's the whole premise of the, of, of, of Christ wouldn't have come. Man, man needed a savior. Yes, certainly. And if you go back to, and we never, and again, God is sovereign. He does what he wants to do when he wants to do it. But in recorded history, we can see the fallacy of man right in the garden. Man got in his own self-conceit and was deceived because man wanted to be deceived. I'm talking about mankind. The Lord said, don't, and mankind said, well, if I'm going to be as God, you know, that fruit over there is attractive. Everything else was open. So even from the first man, Man has operated in deception and needed the Lord to save him from himself. And there's not anything new under the sun. It's, now it's just a little bit more publicized. And now, think about it. People have the, the ability to have the full indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon their salvific and grace call. As soon as it happens, you got as much Holy Spirit as you can stand. And the world still like this? But man has always fallen into a pattern of not recognizing the necessity and for, for not only the Lord's love, but for his, for his salvation. Because we're saved when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. Yeah, we're saved then. But you know what? Peter said, Lord, save me. And he was already part of the... And sometimes I, Lord, I need you to save me from myself. I need you to save me from circumstance. I need you. And then here, now we live in this age, everybody talking about deliverance. Everybody's not delivered. Sometimes the, the Lord is just with you enough so that, that, that what would, would keep you undelivered doesn't take you over. But if everybody's delivered, then what happens if you're not delivered? You fall back in the same pattern. But if I've, got, if, I, if I've got mercy and grace and the Lord trying to help, trying to help me, let me say this and then see if this says, sounds good. The Lord trying to help me to not be me. David said, I, I was born in sin and shaping in iniquity. That's who I am. But the same David who had blood on his hands for as many bodies that he had killed for, 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 for the nation was a man after God's own heart. What? Same David that had Uriah killed and, and got sons by Bathsheba. Yeah, same David. The possibility is because of who God is. The possibility is because of who Jesus is. If we write, Think about it. If we wrote the story of some of the them that are in Hebrews 11, if we wrote some of them throughout the, the historicity of the Bible and we say, would you use this person as, as an example to follow? By human standards, most of the time, no. 
Think about all those Pauline epistles. It, it, before the Damascus Road, man, Paul was hell on the church intentionally. Then the Lord changed him. Now, let's talk about that. Man, the church got a big problem with folks changing. Here's, here's the thing. We're supposed to be agents of hope, agents of change, but we always are skeptical of somebody who's lost is going to ever change. I'm going to say this. I, I had to guilt myself. I remember a gentleman, and, you know, names will be removed to protect the innocent, and was accused of smoking dope with his son while his son was in school. That's what they did. The Lord changed him. Now he's a deacon in somebody's church. I bump into him at a whole church conference. I wasn't expecting to see him there. Why was I surprised he was there? The Lord can put the beer down, put the... Put the weed down. The, the Lord can change. You know how I know it? Change me. I don't know who I was talking to. And I was like, man, they're trying to figure out, man, what? Man, I kicked out of a second grade, and, and, and it was promised to get kicked out of another second grade, and they were trying to make a decision if they had to send me back to the first, second grade. Second grade! Seven years, seven, eight years old. They're like, what is going on? Who is this? Whose kid is this? Let me break. I had both my parents at home at the time. We're middle class. But I didn't have Jesus in my life, so I was acting as if I just was young in doing it. Some people get, get older and more mature in their sin. I was young in mine, but I needed deliverance from there. And that's who Jesus is. So even in the midst of this situation on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they, well, now I can understand that better because when I was in the midst of my midst, he was standing there with arms outstretched. Sometimes if, if, if we communicate that Jesus had his arms outstretched for us, then somebody else will find him the same way. Let's move on. Time to reflect. As we reflect on Luke 23, 34, we can apply the following principles to our lives. Recognize that forgiveness is a powerful expression of God's love and grace and strive to extend that forgiveness to others even when it is difficult. Seek to understand the perspectives and experiences of those who have hurt or wronged us and be willing to offer grace and forgiveness even when they may not fully understand the impact of their actions. That's a tough one. Our responsibility is to forgive, but you're forgiving somebody that doesn't know that you're forgiving them, and then you have the worry, well, I'm going to have to deal with this again. Well, well, Jesus does that. If he's faithful and just to forgive as much as we ask, shouldn't we be faithful and just to forgive? Oh, yeah, that, that's, hmm. Remember that Jesus' forgiveness extends to us as well and gratefully accept his grace and mercy in our own lives. What burdens a lot of people is they won't forgive themselves. I can't believe I did. Well, guess what? Sin is common to man. So there's nothing new under the sun and there's probably nothing new under your sun either. So accept his grace and mercy. Allow Jesus' example of forgiveness to influence our own relationships and interactions, striving to be a source of grace and love to those around us. Be willing to forgive. I'm in a, in a study right now of, of, of that. Really an attack of the enemy is to keep us bound up with a bunch of strife and contrition, and it all is the root of it is unforgiveness. Turn to God for strength and guidance in the process of forgiving others, trusting that he can help us overcome our own pain and bitterness. On the other side of forgiveness is a lot of pain and bitterness. Hurt people hurt people. And that's just not out there outside the four walls of the church. Well, how may we accomplish this? We can always pray. Prayer of the day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incredible example of forgiveness demonstrated by Jesus on the cross. We are humbled by your unconditional love and mercy towards us, even in the, our moments of ignorance and sin. Help us to embrace your forgiveness in our own lives and to extend the same forgiveness to others. 
even when it is difficult. Lord, grant us the strength and wisdom to see beyond our own pain and understand the perspectives of those who have hurt us. Empower us to be conduits of your grace, offering forgiveness and healing to those around us. May our lives reflect your love and mercy, drawing others close to you. You pray that prayer, it's some pain and bitterness that can't be present. It's some hurts that will resolve. It's some forgiveness that will be extended. It'll be some grace and mercy that are understood. And sometimes the hardest prayer to, to pray is, is one that makes you the action item of your prayer. Just like we used to sing, and I'm saying we because I even used to sing back then. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Then you have to, there's another verse, it's not in there, but it's, it's, it's close to it. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing as the answer to this prayer. We're talking about it, but I got to be about it. Because that which is accomplished by the Lord, many times we're the, we talk about being the hands and feet of God, being his representative. Sometimes it's being the answer for our own prayer. Let's move on. Strengthen in faith. Considering Luke 23, 34, take these action steps to practice forgiveness and grow in grace. Reflect on areas in your life where you may need to extend forgiveness to others and ask God for the strength and courage to do so. It's not going to be easy. That's why you're asking for strength and courage when you do so. Meditate on the forgiveness that Jesus offers you and gratefully accept his grace and mercy in your own life. You can't ask somebody else to accept it if you're not accepting it. Number three, share your experiences of extending or receiving forgiveness with others, offering encouragement and hope to those who may be struggling with this aspect of their faith journey. Talk to other people about forgiveness when you forgave and when somebody else forgave you. And you know what's a tough thing? When you have to tell people about when somebody else forgave you. Because sometimes it's easier to talk about when you had to forgive somebody else, but it's, it's tough when, it's, when you're the... And, and then let's talk, let's talk about this. The longer you live in life, there's somebody that you probably have forgotten you need to ask forgiveness from. You got more life. You're older. You got more years. You got more months. You got more weeks. You got more days. You got more decades. But if you, th if you think real hard, probably somebody is saying, yeah, man, would you, man, forgive me. I I, I, wasn't, I wasn't who the Lord intended me to be. But I'm, I'm trying to be better on that now. My conversation's different. My walk's different. I've grown in the grace and knowledge of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here's who I am now. Who I was then is not who I am now, even though that was me. I'm not a clone of, 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 of who that person is. That, that's still me, but that activity and that behavior is not me. I'm trying to, to go beyond that. And then I may disappoint you again, but, but now where my heart is, that's not my intention. Back then, uh, you know, sometimes people, people, people caught some, some tough ones from having to deal with us and having associations with us because we didn't understand forgiveness and we didn't understand grace and we didn't understand mercy. So when you act as, as, as if those aren't a part of your life, they'll show up that you're not acting that way. And I'm guilty for making some relationships casual that shouldn't have been. Some other people had intention, more intention than I had intention. Well, I, f I find out about that more often than I should. But you know what? Got to own it. In the immaturity of my youth, that's who I was. Thankful I'm not, I'm, I'm not everything I'm yet going to be, but I'm thankful I'm not that. But if I hadn't talked to you in 30 years, well, you probably got a different opinion. And I'm not as old as some of y'all, so my 30 years, your 10, 20 years, your 40 years, your Nobody's from here. You go back home. Some people have got some different opinions. So that's why you don't stay there. I'm just saying what I'm saying. Cops Cove Colleen ain't that nice. Some, some of y'all from some nicer places, but <laughs> they ain't going to open out the welcoming mat. The you who you were then, we're thankful that it's not the you you are now, but uh, you're, not, you're not trying to have everybody to remind you. You remember when? Man, I'm thankful, man, when I was a devil, I was young. 
I'm thinking with people in my elementary school. I'm just talking about me. I haven't run into any of them. I'm thankful I remember a lot of people from sixth grade. I was saved by then. And I bumping them all the time. I was like, man, if you'd have met me before I moved here, boy, I was a piece of work. Just talking about me, right? No, you too. You just not, you just don't have the microphone. So move on. Today's, today's wisdom. Luke 23, 34 serves as a powerful reminder of the depth of Jesus' love and forgiveness. Even in the face of unimaginable pain and suffering, as we strive to follow his example, we can experience the transformative power of forgiveness in our own lives and in our relationships with others. May we continually seek God's strength and guidance as we endeavor to extend forgiveness to those who have hurt us, trusting in his grace and mercy to heal our hearts and draw us closer to him. As we embrace Jesus' forgiveness and seek to share it with others, may we be a source of hope, healing, and reconciliation in a broken world. Let our lives serve as a testament to the power of God's love and grace, inspiring others to seek his forgiveness and experience the freedom and peace that only he can provide. Some people will meet Jesus when we act like Jesus. Christ-like character brings Christ-like associations. So if I understand that I'm forgiven and I forgive, if I understand that I've received grace and mercy and I extend it, that's different than what most people receive. And some people have some hard lives just from the people that they run into. And wouldn't it be better if they didn't run into somebody uh, full of vitriol and hate that's supposed to be associated with the, the church that Jesus died for? Let's go a little bit deeper talking about that forgiveness. Sometimes we may feel like we're the only one who forgives. The situation that troubled his disciples too. Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, Jesus said unto him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but 70 times seven in Matthew 18. That's 490 times. It's a lot of forgiveness. Seven is, you got enough hands for that. 490, that's more than fingers and toes and everything else. And then if you have to keep count, you haven't really. So then we talk about our interpersonal relationships, close relationships amongst our family, marriages, and whatever else. If you got to count how often you forgive or remind somebody of when you forgave, you're not really forgiven. Because when the Lord took our sin, he placed it in a place called the Sea of Forgiveness. Now, the Sea of Galilee, I could probably find, but the Sea of Forgiveness, I'm thankful the Lord finds. Here's one thing we've got to rash and wrap our heads around. The words of Christ are not always easy to live by, but they must be observed. If, the, if Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, then we're going to have to say, Father, forgive them for they know what they do and what they don't know that they're doing. We've got to forgive on both. He forgave them in the midst of ignorance, hate, and a whole bunch of other things that they didn't even understand, but he forgave them. And here it is now, the reason why many times we don't act with a heart of forgiveness and Jesus is so hard to understand is we don't, we don't want to forgive what we understand. We want to answer, well, why did they do this to me? And why did this happen to me? And why did this take place? And you spend so much time in the, in the paralysis of analysis. Thank you, Joel Gregory, trying to figure out what is your responsibility. My responsibility is just forgive. It's not to, to be Perry Mason. Not to be Matlock trying to figure out and get to all, the, all sort through all the evidence. Nobody, the Lord never asked us to be judge and jury. He's asked us to be obedient. And obedience is better than, you know what else obedience is better than? Some of the other stuff that, that keeps us from obedience. We'll sacrifice our sanity, our sleep, our time, everything, our emotions, just not being obedient. 
And then after it's all over with, then we want to be as obedient as we can because all that stuff that kept us up and wet our pillows and, and, and crushed our hearts and, 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 and troubled our minds, we finally let it go. Now we're, now we're ready to, well, no, just start with obedience. Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. He, he didn't wait till he was dead. He didn't say it at the resurrection. He said it in the midst of turmoil and torment, unspeakable pain. He's speaking forgiveness. And, and, and here it is. We, we've been nicked, not hurt. We've been nicked and we'll operate with the absence of forgiveness. But we got to begin the process of forgiveness. We're closing on this. How do you begin the process of forgiveness? One, keep no list of wrongs. Pray for your antagonists rather than plot against them. Hate the wrong without hating wrongdoers. Turn your attention away from them for what they did to you to what Jesus did for you. And finally, as outrageous as it may seem, Jesus died for them too. If he thinks they're worth forgiving, they are. Forgiveness from the cross. If he can forgive from the cross, there's nowhere I can ever be where I cannot forgive. I got a cross to, to carry. I got a cross to bear, but I didn't have a cross to die on. And so to truly understand this Jesus you may not know, understand if he can forgive from the cross, then instead of our minds wondering to, to how he did that, let our minds wonder, let, let our spiritual imaginations go to what else can he do? And understand he's bigger than any situations and circumstance that I face in life. And so if he is, then my trust needs to be fully in him. And if other people are lacking hope, if other people are downtrodden and beaten down by life, I can say, hey, I know, I know, I know somebody. He's greater than your, your situation, your circumstances, your pain, and your hurt. And sometimes people, we just need to point people to Jesus because there's a whole lot of people we point them to. to They fall out of favor. They fall out of vogue, but Jesus never does. So if anybody asks us, why, why, why do you believe? Why do you hope? Why, 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 why do you have the confidence that you do? Jesus is the, is, the, is the hope of my salvation. He is my everything. Because when something comes up and rears it up, he's, he's bigger than that. When it seems like my whole world is, is breaking and tearing asunder, he's greater than that. And so if he is that, then understand uh, you need to know him because he can forgive from the cross. Uh, anything that we got going on uh, is, is well within his wheelhouse. Amen? Amen. Any questions, any, any comments? Amen. With that being said, be mindful of the activities we got coming up and Church anniversary on the horizon on the third Sunday. Amen. So we'll be potlucking in the afternoon and deacon family plan. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, in service and worship too, but that always turns out turns out good. But I'm looking looking forward to that and pray that you are too. Amen. Amen. And continue to pray for those that are bereaved, sick, and recovering from surgery. Most righteous and everlasting Father, Lord, we thank you for this privilege to be here in the midst of this study. Lord, help us to continue to know more about you as it fosters our relationship with you. Lord, we thank you that not only you're able to forgive from the cross, but you're able to forgive sitting on the right hand of the Father. And so, Lord, we thank you even now for, for coming for our salvation, but also coming even now uh, in the midst of what life may challenge us with. That, Lord, knowing if you can forgive from the cross, there's nothing that we can face that's greater than than what you can handle. And so, Lord, we just want to earnestly thank you for all that you are and all that you do. It's in the strong and powerful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen.